Hello and welcome to Spirit Pig. Inspired by the mission that 7 billion fulfilled people, I track down the greatest thought leaders on the planet and interview them about happiness and fulfillment. Today I'm speaking with Stanley Krippner, PhD. Stanley is the Professor of Psychology at Saybrook University. He is internationally known for his pioneering work in the scientific investigation on human consciousness, especially areas such as creativity, parapsychological phenomena and altered states of consciousness. He's authored, co-authored or edited. I think I went on your website. I had to count them up one by one. I think it's 42 books. It's, it's a lot. Um, and he's invited to speak all around the globe. And in 2002, he received the American Psychological Association Award for Distinguished Contributions to the International Advancement of Psychology. Stanley, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Fine. It's a pleasure. It sounds like you have a terrific show. Oh, well. It's a it's a huge honor to have you on, and so I've been um yeah I've been trying to I've been trying to get you for a while. So this is this is super exciting, and uh, one of your missions for uh, most of your scientific life has been trying to free people from pathologizing their experiences. What exactly do you mean by that? Many people have unusual experiences, and they think they're going crazy. For example when a loved one makes them a phone call and gives them information that nobody else could know. And yet there is their loved one on the phone or sometimes in a dream giving them personal information. That's one example. Another example is when somebody has a dream about an event in the future and that event takes place in three or four days, exactly as the person had dreamed it. And they think they're going crazy. Another example is when people wake up in the middle of the night and it looks like they're out of the body and they see things from the ceiling that are happening down below. And they think they're crazy. In psychiatric terms, we say, these might, be, these might be pathological symptoms. And yet, if you take a close scientific look at all of these phenomena, very, very rarely would you consider them pathological or crazy. Now, there are people who are severely mentally ill, who are suffering from different types of schizophrenia or bipolar conditions, some of them have these experiences too, but their experiences are not really the same because they believe that they're dreaming about the future, but that event in the future never happens. Or they believe that they're getting a phone call from a loved one who's died, that person is still alive. So don't have the same type of experience as the folks that are who are well functioning, but who have a strange experience and they think something might be wrong with them. Now, now there are, I think, at least it was six or seven. I think there are at least seven procedures or experiments in parapsycho um, parapsychology that have been able to be repeated and replicated um, multiple times, again and again. Could you maybe just share some of these? I, I, I've heard of one, um, and it's called precognition. But um, can you maybe share a couple of others? Well, it depends on who you ask. The debunkers would say that there is no phenomena that's been repeated. You cannot depend on any of these experiments. So keep in mind there's another side of the story than what I'm telling you. People in parapsychology say that there is evidence for telepathy, knowledge of another person's thoughts, clairvoyance, the awareness of something going on at a distant or hidden location, precognition, a uh, sense of the future, something that actually does come true, healing, where a person has an ex inexplicable healing experience, reincarnation, where somebody believes that they have lived before and uh, have some data that correspond with the past life. Near-death experiences where people think they're dead or actually certified as dead, yet come back to life with various memories of uh, what the afterlife was like. 
And if you are to come up with seven, I would say post-cognition, somebody who comes up with an event from the distant past, like in medieval times or even two or 300 years ago, and that checks out with what we know about that particular time era. You, you mentioned uh, the, uh, the debunkers just there, and that's something I definitely want to jump into. I loved um, reading about your work, uh, Debating Psychic Experience. And so basically, you invited the leading experts in parapsychology, and you also invited the world's leading skeptics and, de- and debunkers, and basically just allowed them to battle it out. Who won the debate? Was there, was there, was there a clear winner, or did, like, did, did both sides put their hands up and think that they, they, they had the, uh, the knockout blow? Oh, yes. Both sides thought that they were right, (laughs) and there was no compromise, no uh, uh, in-between. The book really shows a polarized point of view. My co-editor, Harris Friedman, and I wrote an afterword to the book in which we pointed out some areas in which we thought that there could be some semblance of working together and finding areas of agreement. Nobody's taken us up on that, but at least we laid out the blueprints. Okay, well, quite recently, maybe about six months ago or so, um, Dr. Dean Radin came on the show, and he was telling us about, um, he was telling us about a few experiments, one of them being precognition. What would, uh, what would the debunkers say? What would their, like, main argument be? Because that seemed to be repeatable again and again and again, and, um, what would what would be their that main argument? Because that's that seemed pretty scientific just from the studies and the way he was describing it. Yes, the bunkers would raise a very good point. First of all, would they say there are so many experiences in the world happening every day, in fact every minute every day, that some of them are going to match. Mm. Some experience a person has yesterday might match an experience that they would have two days from now coincidence because there's so much going on and so much happening and so when there is a match those are the ones that the people remember when you take this inside the laboratory they would probably say well there's a flaw someplace in the design and so let's look at the flaw and if there is no flaw in the design repeat it and repeat it in such a way that the most skeptical people can repeat it with the same results. So that would be their response. Either repeat, it's either coincidence, mm. a flaw in the design, or it's unrepeatable. Well, that, no, I, I, t- I totally agree. The, 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 I thought the, um, you know, the experiment when people are shown either uh, a traumatic image for example versus just a just a just a just a a nice image and then when they see the traumatic image then there's increase in cortisol the stress hormone goes up maybe like a i I don't know what the actual numbers were but like milliseconds beforehand before the image even appeared that seemed repeatable how how would they say that wasn't clearly repeatable evidence a psychologist by the name of james alcock wrote a long article for the Skeptical Inquirer magazine pointing out three basic flaws in that experiment. So, you might agree with them or not, but even that experiment did not pass the muster of the debunkers. (laughs) By the end of the 1980s, uh, parapsychology laboratories began to close and the field saw a steep decline in interest and financial support. What, What was driving that? Just general skepticism or was was there was there other reasons i think that the reason why so many parapsychological laboratories closed is that parapsychology was no longer uh attractive enough to attract funding because of three things first of all the lack of a repeatable experiment that could be depended upon And by the way, repeatable experiments are not uh, all that common in mainstream psychology either, but Mm. that's another story. (laughs) Okay, number two, there was no theoretical explanation that could account for them that would pass muster. And number three, 
and I think most important, no practical use that people could get money from. When you give money to an enterprise and there's no practical use coming back, uh, why continue to do the money? Even the U.S. government that spent untold millions of dollars on parapsychology research during the Cold War finally closed the door saying it didn't repeat itself. There was no practical example that we could depend upon that was better than our ordinary means of uh, intelligence. And so uh, why keep pouring money into a rat hole? Now, the people who are actually doing the experiments would disagree with that, and they would say, well, we identified a secret Russian uh, laboratory that turned out to be true. We found a kidnapped diplomat, according to uh, uh, our remote viewers, and that came out true. Or we showed events happening on a distant planet that later checked out to be true. and. So um, there were, shall we say, occasional successes. By the way, all of that has now been written up by both the Russians and the Americans who are doing top secret ESP research. And so anybody that's interested can go online and look at the book edited by Edward May, M-A-Y, and then they can read the whole story about the Cold War espionage attempt and judge for themselves if it was worth shutting it down or not. Okay, so these are obvious reasons why, I guess, why we should be skeptical or, but what has encouraged you to spend so much of your life in this area? Why are you on the front line? You know, why, didn't you, why do you not just close up, like, close up shop like, like other people? Well, I would say two things. First of all is curiosity. And I think that when you're curious about something, you need to examine it and not just accept what other people are telling you. And I prefer to examine it uh, scientifically. Some people examine it by going to a guru or a uh, religious leader or a cult leader and get very quick answers. In science, there is no quick answer. There's no... Uh, answer that is good for all time. And many people are not too comfortable with the uncertainty that comes with the scientific approach. Nevertheless, I don't have any trouble living with uncertainty, especially when it comes to important aspects of this. The second reason is that I have known too many people who have been absolutely freaked out by these experiences, and I wanted to do something that would ease their discomfort and make them live a, a happier life. And the most important book that I've written on this topic, actually co-edited on the topic, is The Variety of Anomalous Experience. And we look at a dozen different anomalous experiences, not only in parapsychology, by the way, but in other fields as well, and show that for the most part, people who have these experiences are as mentally healthy as anybody else, and that there are scientific ways of investigating the phenomena, and in some cases, scientific explanations for these phenomena. Do you, do you believe that there'll be a time when uh, they've been proved without a shadow of doubt, and it, and it just becomes the new norm, it becomes the new accepted, and then, you know, then, then we're on to trying to discover other scientific things. Do you think this will be, I don't know, the, in, in the same way that you know everyone believed you know the the world was flat and now it's just of course it's it's round do you think this is going to be at some stage in the future just like oh it's just a given or do you think that there's always going to be this 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 tug of war between uh, the two camps well of course it's already happened back at the turn of the century the british society for psychical research had a whole list of topics that they were investigating such as hypnosis and multiple personality and um, hallucinations, which were outside of uh, recognized science, and, of course, parapsychology. 
Every single one of those is now mainstream except for parapsychology. Nobody, debu nobody debunks hypnosis anymore. There are various points of view on hypnosis, but that once was viewed with great skepticism. Also, nobody doubts that there are people who have multiple personalities. These are now classified as dissociative identity disorders, and that uh, uh, there actually are cases where people can swift shift from one identity to another. Nobody doubts that anymore. Of course, these people generally need psychotherapy, but nobody doubts, nobody in the mainstream doubts that this is a valid phenomenon, at least for some people. Nobody doubts that there is such a phenomena as dissociation, where people can dissociate, leave what they're doing, and their attention travels someplace else, and then they come back to what they're doing and uh, just pick up where it goes on. So dissociation is part of the mainstream. So there are many, many examples which about 120 years ago were thought to be outside the mainstream, not worthy of consideration, and contradicted by mainstream science. All but parapsychology are now being uh, investigated by mainstream explorers. And even a few parapsychological experiences are being investigated by mainstream explorers. For example, there are now people investigating out-of-body experiences. And some very good uh, explanations have come about in terms of what happens in the brain and the nervous system when somebody is having out-of-body experience. And there are some people can actually, in a laboratory, trigger an out-of-body experience and get a person to experience being out of the body. Now, whether or not they're really out of the body is a different thing, but that's the difference between an event and experience. An event would be if they're actually out of the body. An experience would be if they think they're out of the body and have the experience of being out of the body. So at least the experiences are being investigated. What role in slight, slight uh, gear shift, what role in modern society do you feel psychedelics should have? Well, of course, I have been interested in psychedelics since the 1950s, ever since I read a Life magazine report of Maria Sabina in Mexico, who was administering psilocybin mushrooms to her clients. She was discovered by a New York, pardon me, a Boston banker, Gordon Wasson, and he and his crew were able to record a session, a mushroom balada, as they say in Spanish, B-E-L-A-D-A, and brought this ritual to international attention. And little did I know that a few decades later, I would actually be with Maria Sabina, interviewing her, uh, taking the last photographs of her that were ever taken before her death a few years later. And so my experience with psychedelics goes way, way back. In the 1960s, I felt it was very, very un unfortunate that in their panic, the government shut down the legitimate psychedelic research and we've lost decades of valuable research. Now, of course, it started up again. We find that psilocybin, for example, can be used to combat bipolar disorder and other mental problems. We find that ayahuasca, which is a tea made from South American plants, can be used to treat a variety of mental illnesses and can cure some types of addiction. And so all of this could have happened if the government hadn't packed, panicked back in the uh, mid-1960s and shut everything down. You mentioned there some of the research which is now, like, which is now happening. Yeah, I think there's like, um, John, Hops uh, John Hopkins University are doing some great research. Um, lots of like, things, you know, there's obviously MAPS, the uh, Multidisciplinary, Multidisciplinary Association, Association for Psychedelic, Psychedelic Studies. Studies. You mentioned there like um, PTSD, 
whatever whatever areas, whatever therapeutic um, areas is it being explored in? Like PTSD is one of them, I know. Um, well, let me just comment on that. Uh, MAPS has done a wonderful job in terms of raising money for research. We can't depend upon the government for giving money for research. Mm. The best we can hope for is the, gover the government will approve of the studies being done. But to get past the Food and Drug Administration takes not months, but years. It takes three years to get permission to do this work. And then, as in PTSD, yes, there are some studies going on, but with a few dozen people. It should be a few thousand people. There are so many people in the United States, especially veterans suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. MAPS recently had a news release one more person admitted to PTSD studies. Can you imagine a headline? It's news when one more person gets admitted to this life-changing uh, protocol. It should be 100 new people have been admitted. No, the government in the United States is very, very wary of this for many, many reasons. First of all is the old prejudice against psychedelics being dangerous. Um, Marijuana being dangerous, but as you know, I cannot think of one death due, due to marijuana in this past year. I can think of several deaths due to standard psychoactive drugs like Prozac. But uh, that brings me to the important thing. What we call big pharma in the United States, the major pharmaceutical companies, are freaked out that there might be a cheap, inexpensive substance namely the psychedelics, that can do a better job than they can do. A friend of mine, Irving Kirsch, did a monumental study on bipolar disorder using Prozac and the standard drugs for one half the group, using hypnosis for the other half of the group. They were about the same results, hypnosis being a little better than Prozac, and the big drug companies jumped on him they found criticism with his research. They vilified him because he was threatening the millions, in fact, the billions that they make each year from pharmaceutical drugs. Now, hypnosis has absolutely no side effects, even if it doesn't work. The psychoactive uh, medication have tons of side effects, some of them very, very serious in terms of changing the brain for the worse. To get over PTSD, you have to have three things going for you. You have to change the belief system of the person with post-traumatic stress disorder. You have to change the behavior of the person with post-traumatic stress disorder. And you have to change the brain, the three Bs, as we say in English. Well, psychoactive drugs like Prozac change the drain, brain for the worse. And hypnosis and meditation and psychotherapy changed the brain for the better. So there you have the big news of what's going on and why psychedelics are not being used more often for PTSD and bipolar disorder and other uh, disorders. Uh, it's due to the strength of the pharmaceutical industry. Also, why is not hypnosis? used more often. Hypnosis is a lifelong interest of mine. It works very well. There are studies showing that people who go to psychotherapists, where hypnosis is a small part of the psychotherapy, have less time in psychotherapy and have higher satisfaction than people that don't. And so you take a look at the scientific data and you can find out that hypnosis works better than drugs. Uh, Psychotherapy works better than drugs, and my hunch is that psychedelics will work better than pharmaceutical drugs. But you've got a lot of opposition from people with money and power in the United States. So I say, let some other countries do the work where they don't have the big pharma to contend with. Well, that, that's, that's a really interesting point at the end, because when, for example... Um, I was talking to a guy called Johan Hari, and he was talking about um, in Portugal how when they decriminalize drugs, when you have a country who almost takes the lead and the results are so clear to see, you know, in terms of they had, I think, 
I'm, I think I think it was was it heroin or I think it was heroin or meth. I can't remember, but they had one of the worst. I think one percent of the population, it was something crazy, were addicted to drugs. And then when they decriminalized it, they've had these ama- these amazing results. And so I think you almost need, like you said, one or two countries or states to almost be the poster child to come out with results which are just so clear to see. And then it's almost like a no-brainer. Then there's almost like this peer pressure for other countries to jump on. So hopefully there'll be other countries and other kind of places which are kind of, yeah, like lead, leading this one. Well, the United States will probably be among the last, but you're correct in what you say about Portugal. And you don't know this, but I was in favor of legalization of marijuana in an article I wrote in 1974. And... um. That article is on file. Anybody can read it, but it was a sign of the times. I said, this is inevitable. There's so little proven negative side effects of marijuana, especially as compared with pharmaceutical drugs, with alcohol, tobacco, that sooner or later, uh, people will realize that. And you talked about Portugal. Look at the state of Colorado. You have similar results. People are saying, Teenagers are going to start to smoke more and more marijuana. After marijuana was legalized, teenage use actually went down. (laughs) It was no longer a risky thing to do. It lost its glamour. It lost its appeal. So all of these predictions that I've been listening to for decades and decades and decades about the evils of legalization of marijuana just have collapsed once it has actually been tried. I've been in Portugal Spain is getting close to Portugal in terms of legalization. And, of course, the Netherlands has been a pioneer in this area for many, many years. Hmm. Is, is there anything? Also, there's another important point here. And that is, don't people have control over what they put into their minds and what into their bodies, even if it's going to do them harm? If it's not hurting anybody else, shouldn't people have the right over their minds and bodies? Why have the government come in and tell them what to do with their minds and bodies? It's just as bad as the government coming in telling women what to do with their bodies in terms of birth control and pregnancy and abortion. The government uh, often pokes its fingers in areas that they have no right to legislate on. In the United States, we have a political party called the Libertarian Party, which nobody has heard of in Europe because it's so small, but they have the right idea. They say, keep the government out of the bedroom, keep the government out of the brain, keep the government out of private enterprise. They have a whole list of ways that the government is actually doing more harm than good. And obviously, the government does do many good things, but uh, um, so we need government, but we have to also take a close look and see if and when the government is infringing on personal liberties and civil rights what? instead of supporting civil liberties and human rights. Is there anything that you believe to be true that you are unable to prove? First of all, in science, we don't use the word proof. You never prove anything 100%. Science is always an open system. You never know when what you thought was an established theory is going to be upended by somebody else. Even some Nobel Prize winning contributions have now been debunked. So you never really know. Science always has to be open to skepticism, to debate, to other ideas, and I tell my students, if you want to use the word proof, confine it to mathematics. Yes, there's proof in mathematics. Confine it to logic. Yes, there are logical proofs, and confine it to whiskey. Whiskey is (laughs) X percent proof. Don't use it for science. For example, we've been telling anthropological students for years that... uh, Humanity goes back 100,000 years, and that was sort of a set date. And it's been taught in classrooms to millions of students. Just a few months ago, ruins were discovered of a skeleton in Morocco. Yes, human-like in every form go back 
back 300,000 years. All right, now the books have to be rewritten. So you simply never know when something is going to be upended. What does a fulfilled life mean to you? I really have trouble with the word fulfilled. It really depends what you mean by fulfilled. For example, you're speaking from Netherlands, which is a developed country. You're speaking to me in the United States, which is a developed country. You're from the UK, which is a developed country. What about the people starving in sub-Saharan Africa? Are they ever going to live a fulfilled life? Day by day, they're looking for food, clothing, shelter. At the end of the day, if they found all three, that's as close as they will come to fulfillment. So your question is coming from, if I dare say it, a white male Anglo point of view. It is not from a point of view that pertains to most of the people in the world who wouldn't even know what you mean by fulfillment. So I have great trouble with questions like that because it ignores people who are living in poverty, which is most of the world. It ignores people who don't know if they're going to be alive from one day to the next, which applies to the refugees who are now streaming into Europe and who are producing massive problems in the Netherlands, in Germany, in certain other countries in Western Europe. And this is just the beginning, just mm -hmm. at the beginning of all of the problems. Are their lives fulfilled? No, not at all from our standards. Are their lives fulfilled from their point of view? No, not at all. They're very unhappy, but it's better than being back in the Middle East where they could die any day from brutality, from terror, or from starvation. People who are listening to the show really should take a close look at their own lives and be thankful that they can even ask questions like fulfillment. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the fact that we're even, you know, having a Skype call, like already just, just, just that means we're already like really got nothing to worry about. So no, it's, it's, it's a very good point. What is one thing our listeners can start doing today that will have a positive impact on their lives. If you had to give what one is, piece of, if you had to give our listeners one piece of actionable advice that they can go away and all do today, what would you what would you suggest? You know, I don't give advice because I've said I've made so many mistakes in my own life. I like to get advice rather than give <laughs> advice. But if you're pushing me on the topic, I would say, when you wake up in the morning, be glad that you're still alive. You might be ailing, you might be diseased, you might be hurt, you might be depressed, but at least you survive to live another day. Make the best of this day because it might be your last. You might be killed by a terrorist. You might be killed by an atomic bomb that some crazy uh, Eastern or Western leader is going to unleash upon the world. You might be uh, struck by some incurable disease that terminates you immediately. So this day might be your last. What can you do today that will bring some joy, some happiness, some love into your world and into uh, life in general? Those you care about, your neighbors, those you've never met, what can you do to make a little bit of positive difference in this day, even though it might be your last? That's the advice I would give. Last but not least, how can people find out more about you and your work? Where can we send them? I have a website, of course, where they can find out more than they'd ever want to know. www.stanleykrippnerweebly.com. Amazing. And I, if you go to spiritpig.com, I'm going to, I'll have that linked up. So if you, if you forgot that, just, it'll, there'll be a hyperlink that you can take and use straight to your website. Stanley, that's absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much for coming on the show today and sharing all those amazing ideas, experiments, and just just boun bouncing fascinating information around. So I really appreciate you taking the time. Really I appreciate you. your very intelligent questions. You are an excellent TV host. Your listeners are very, very lucky that they've tuned in because the time they spend listening to your shows is not time wasted. It's time of learning and joy and all good things.